Okay, let's turn to Joshua 12. And uh, we're pretty much done with the major wars of conquest uh, that Joshua led Israel through. They first, as we know, came into Jericho and then took Ai and probably Bethel about that same time. And those are sort of in the center of the land of Canaan that had to be conquered. And then they could have moved either south or north, but the decision was made actually for them by their enemies because they had entered into a a covenant with Gibeon to be, Gibeon was to be their servants, and therefore Israel was somewhat obligated to protect them. And a coalition of five kings from the south, led by Adonai Zedek, who was the king of Jerusalem at the side, the, Jeb- the Jebusites, and, uh, and four other kings with him, attacked Gibeon, not Israel. But because Gibeon and Israel were in a coalition and then were allies, Israel came to Gibeon's aid and uh, ended up slaughtering those kings and defeating them. And then while they were there, since that was in the southern area of the country, they just kept conquering one city after another in the region until the whole south was largely subdued. All opposition was gone. So now they had gone into the center and they'd taken care of the south. But then there was a coalition of virtually all the kings of the Canaanites in the north that gathered together and they came against Joshua. So in a sense, uh, although these kings were acting uh, sort of defensively because Joshua was clearly there to take their territory, uh, in a sense he didn't attack them until they militarized against him. So his his battles against him ended up being, as it were, somewhat defensive. Uh, But, of course, if they had not mobilized against him, he would have attacked them anyway. But the point is that the the decision as to which regions to to fight with were pretty much made by the actions of the enemies. And so finally, he conquers the northern territory. And not every city has now been totally eradicated of the Canaanites. And the, the command that God gave was that they should not leave any that breathe and that all the Canaanites should be wiped out. But the Israelites didn't complete that task, but they did complete the securing of the, of the borders enough that the Bible could summarize that, they, that God gave them all the land. They really were in control of all the land, but there were pockets of resistance that still needed to be overcome. Uh, many times people have likened that to the Christian life, of course, that you know when we cross um, over into the promised land, when we become Christians, as it were, that God gives us victory, he gives us promises, he gives us inheritance, but there's still areas of conflict. There's still areas in our lives that present resistance to godliness and to holiness and that need to be fought individually and serially at their proper times. Anyway, that's how Israel was in the land. They owned the land now. They they controlled the borders and most of the cities. Uh, they'd burned down a lot of the cities and had conquered most of the rest, but there were areas where Canaanites still lived among them, and we'll see some specific cases in the chapters that lie ahead. But chapter 12, then, really is just a summary of the various kings that were conquered in the course of securing all the territory. And verses 1 through 6 reminds us of the territory on the uh, east side of Jordan, the land that was inherited by Gad, Manasseh, and Reuben, and which was conquered at an earlier time by Moses. In the lifetime of Moses, they uh, fought against two kings on the east side of the Jordan, Sion and Og, defeated them both and conquered the territory. And that's how the tribes of Reuben and Gad and half of the tribe of Manasseh uh, obtained the land that they asked for and received. So these two kings are mentioned in the first six verses. We see these are the kings of the land whom the children of Israel defeated and whose land they possessed on the other side of the Jordan toward the rising of the sun. That is, of course, to the east. And when it says the other side, it means it's written from somebody who's now in the land. It's written from the standpoint of somebody who's now living in Israel. So they're looking at the east side as the other side of the river from their own standpoint. From the river Arnon to Mount Hermon, 
and all the eastern Jordan plains. Sion, king of the Amorites, who dwelt in Hezbon and ruled half of Gilead from Aroer, which is on the bank of the river Arnon, from the middle of that river, even as far as the river Jabbok, which is the border of the Ammonites, and the eastern Jordan plain from the Sea of Chinnereth, which is actually one of the many names the Bible uses for this, what we call the Sea of Galilee. In the Bible, even in the New Testament, it's called by a variety of names. The Sea of Galilee, sometimes it's called the Lake Gennesaret, or the Sea of Tiberias. It's also in Old Testament times called the Sea of uh, Chinnereth, Chinnereth. And so this is the same body of water. It's really not much of a sea. It's more like a lake. But in a desert where a very large lake is rare, it, they call it a sea in many cases. It's interesting that uh, Matthew, for example, when he talks about this, refers to it as the Sea of Galilee or the Sea of Tiberias. But um, when Luke talks about it, he calls it the lake. And, of course, Matthew was a Jew. And speaking from a Palestinian point of view, this great body of water is like a sea to them. But Luke is a Gentile from across the ocean, and he sees it as a lake. He doesn't refer to it as a sea at all. But that's what's referred to there. It's, it's uh, the boundary of uh, Sion's former territory. And it says, uh, as far as the Sea of the Arabah, the Salt Sea. Now, we call that the Dead Sea. But that's called the Salt Sea because like, like the Salt Sea in Utah, it's got a lot more salt than the average body of water. The road to Beth Jeshemoth and southward below the slopes of Pisgah. So that's one of the two kings, and we've read about that many times before in, in the Pentateuch and so forth as we read about their conquest, and they are mentioned again and again. In retrospect, even before Joshua took the people into Israel, Moses made several references to these in his sermons because it was the token that God gave them that they could, in fact, defeat the Canaanites too, that before they even entered Canaan, God gave them victories over some very formidable enemies in order to sort of build their faith and their confidence that God could do what he was promising to do in Canaan as well. Verse 4 says, Og, this is the other king, king of Bashan and his territory, who was of the remnant of the giants. Now, apparently there had been a race or more than one race of giants. The Anakim were certainly of that race, but they are not the same probably as, as the race of giants mentioned here. It sounds as from this reference, the remnant of the giants, that the, the giant races had mostly died off and there were just like a few, a, a remnant of them left over from a general extinction of a race of giants. But Og was one of the big giants. He actually, uh, the, in the Old Testament, uh, in the Pentateuch, it tells us the size of his bed. I forget the size of his bed, 13 feet tall or something like that. And uh, his, uh, I forget all the things that all the dimensions, but he must have been a very huge man. Uh, actually, the size of his bed, he could have been bigger than Goliath. Goliath was 10 feet tall, but his bed was big enough that he could have been 12 feet tall and slept in it comfortably. Now, he says he was of the remnant of the giants who dwelt at Ashtaroth and Edrei. He reigned over Mount Hermon, over Salka, over Bashan. As far as the border of the Geshurites and the Maacathites, which would be, I think, in the south, and over half of Gilead, as far as the border of Sion, king of Heshbon. These, Moses, the servant of the Lord, and the children of Israel had conquered. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, had given it as a possession to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, something we are re reminded of a great number of times. Now, this, of course, is mentioned out of chronological order since Moses was dead in chapter 1 of Joshua and has not been alive through any of the chapters we've read so far. So it's just before it tells us the full list of kings that Joshua conquered, it decides to add th those kings first that were conquered in the time of Moses before Joshua's time of leadership. One observation is that both uh, Sion and Og are, th their territories are mentioned with reference to what is called Gilead. In verse 2, Sion, it says, he dwelt at Hezbon and ruled half of Gilead. And then we also find Gilead mentioned with reference to Og. Uh, he, he ruled over half of Gilead also. 
Now, Gilead was not a town, but a region, and it wasn't called Gilead when these kings were there. Gilead was actually oh, the name of a, a Jewish man, and uh, it was some of his family that inherited that region, and it was the region was called Gilead afterward. And at, at a certain point, much later, Jeremiah uh, it quotes God as saying, Is there no balm in Gilead? And Gilead is the region named after the tribe, or not the tribe, but the clan, Gilead, of Israelites that were there. But you can see that it's called that here proleptically. Uh, when Sion ruled over it, it wasn't called Gilead, but it came to be later called Gilead. And sometimes the Bible uses names that way of places. Places that weren't really called that when the story was told, but it was, they were called that at the time that the writer was writing the story. So his readers, and he knew that region by that name. But when Sion and Og ruled, it wasn't called that because, of course, uh, Gilead had not yet occupied it. Just observing a, a, a literary device that the writers of Scripture sometimes use, you'll find it in a number of places. Then we have a list of kings, 31 of them in all, that were conquered through the leadership of Joshua. Verse 7 to the end of the chapter, these are the kings of the country which Joshua and the children of Israel conquered on this side of Jordan, on the west, from Baal Gad in the valley of Lebanon as far as Mount Halak and the ascent to Seir. Now, Baal Gad, I believe, is identified with uh, Caesarea Philippi, uh, an area that has had a number of names throughout history. It was also called Panius uh, at one time. It was the place where I think the Romans worshipped the god Pan. And then it became uh, named by uh, Philip, one of the Herods, Herod Philip, renamed it after the Caesar and called it Caesarea and then added his name to it, Philippi. And that was the place where Jesus went with his disciples and who, who do men say I am? And then he said, who do you say I am? And this was a region where Jesus went to uh, retreat to be alone with his disciples because uh, it was pretty much at the remote northern and eastern edge of the country. Uh, it's a really interesting place to go. I, uh, yeah, I, I, I went there when I was in Israel, and it was really amazing because the, the River Jordan begins there. It comes out of the ground. Actually, the River Jordan is fed by three springs in different locations, but one of them, I think the primary one, is in Caesarea Philippi, and that's really where the river begins. And uh, you just watch the water pour out of the ground, the torrents of water that become the river, Jordan, at that spot. It's really interesting. There's other interesting things. There's a beautiful place. But that's, uh, I believe, the same as uh, Baal Gad. And it says, <clears throat> verse 8, in the mountain country, in the lowlands, in the Jordan plain, in the slopes, in the wilderness, in the south, this is the land of the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Those were all the Canaanite tribes that, uh, that God had mentioned to Abraham that he was going to give his seed the land of all those tribes. He'd named them in the 15th chapter of Genesis. And now we list them. Uh, apparently in order of them being conquered. We can't really say for sure because some of these we don't have specific stories about when they were conquered. But we certainly see from the ones we do know about that they're listed in order. We got the king of Jericho, one. That is one king there. The king of Ai, which is beside Bethel, one. Then the king of Jerusalem, one. That was when Adonisedek came against Gibeon. So he got, went down and his confederates who are named here, the king of Hebron, one. The king of Jarmuth, one. The king of Lachish, one. The king of Eglon, one. And then these others. The king of Gezer, one. The king of Debir, one. The king of Gader, one. The king of Hormah, one. The king of Arad, one. The king of Libna, one. The king of Adullam, one. The king of Makeda, one. The king of Bethel, one. The king of Tapua, one. The king of Hefer, one. The king of Aphek, one. The king of Lesharon, one. The king of Madon, one. The king of Hazar, one. The king of Shimron Meron, one. The king of Aksaph, one. The king of Teanak, one. The king of Megiddo, one. The king of Kedesh, one. The king of Jokneam, 
in Carmel, one. The king of Dor in the heights of Dor, one. The king of the people of Gilgal, one. The king of Tirzah, one. All the kings, 31. Now, there were still, like I said, cities to be conquered. But the conquest of these 31 cities, these are the major cities for the most part, and they, uh, the, the fall of these cities to, to Joshua definitely officially changed the, the balance of power in the land to, to the Israelites, and so they now could be said to possess the land. But there were still, as I said, things, regions that had not been totally conquered, and we read about that in chapter 13. Now Joshua was old and advanced in years, and the Lord said to him, you're old and advanced in years. <laughs> he calls it as it is. And there remains very much land yet to be possessed. This is the land that remains. All the territory of the Philistines, all that of the Geshurites, from Sihor, which is east of Egypt, as far as the border of Ekron northward, which is counted as Canaanite. The five lords of the Philistines the Gezites, the Ashdodites, the Ashkelonites, the Gittites, and the Ekronites, also the Avites. Now, all of those except the Avites are the five cities of the Philistines where the Philistine population in Palestine was concentrated. Each of these was a small city-state ruled by its own lord. The word lords there uh, in the original text is not a Hebrew word, but a, it, it's translated from a Philistine word. It's the only place in the Bible that a Philistine word is in the Hebrew text. Uh, it is said that the Philistine word that is used here is related to the Greek word for tyrant. That's uh, Apparently there's some affinities between the Philistine language and the Greek language. But it's the only time in the Bible that we have a Philistine word in the original Hebrew text. Now these, these are famous in Old Testament times as the five cities that remained under the control of the Philistines at least up until the time of David and that was a long time so Joshua in his time and the judges in their time did not manage to rid the land of the Philistines uh, the wars with the Philistines erupted in the time of Samson and Samson probably could have done more if he had been more self-controlled he was more interested in his own pleasure than he was in delivering Israel, but he nonetheless was given supernatural powers to, to beat up Philistines, so he killed a thousand of them once with the jawbone of an ass, killed three thousand of them, uh, you know, in his death in the temple of Dagon when he pulled it down, killed more in his life, in his death than in his lifetime, but altogether one man killing four thousand or more people of the enemy is a pretty big accomplishment, but he never did much to eradicate the Philistine presence in Palestine. Later, Saul, King Saul, fought against the Philistines. Actually, they fought against him. When he was installed as king, the Philistines were not happy about the Israelites uh, ha having a king, and so they attacked. And so wars with the Philistines continued through the whole life of Saul. He was killed by them, uh, and then David fought and defeated the Philistines. Of course, Goliath was a Philistine. He was from Gath. Gath. Um, these names... Uh, in verse 3, the uh, Gazites are the people from Gaza. And uh, the Ashdodites are from Ashdod. The Ashkelonites from Ashkelon. Now the Gittites are from Gath. Gath is a Philistine city and the Bible often makes reference to the Gittites. That's just the name of those who lived in Gath. And then the Ekronites from Ekron. Now the Avites were not the same. But notice it says in verse 3 that these were counted as Canaanite. Now, they weren't Canaanites. The Philistines were of different origins. They had come to Palestine via the island of Crete, uh, which they, they were actually called the people of the sea by the Israelites because the Philistines were seafaring people and the Israelites were not. The Israelites hardly ever had a navy or, or they, they didn't like the sea. They didn't like to go out of, uh, on the water. To them, the sea was evil and, and dangerous and deadly. In fact, the Gentiles were compared to the sea, whereas Israel was compared to the land. They were land lovers. But the Philistines were mariners, and, uh, and they came both to Egypt and to Palestine from the sea and settled in there, and their, their holdings in Palestine were in these five cities for a very long time. 
uh, like I say, until David managed to defeat them. But they were not Canaanites. See, the Canaanites were descended from a man named Canaan, and they were indigenous to the land there. But it says that these Philistines were counted as Canaanites. What that means is that the Israelites were intended to treat them the way they were supposed to treat the Canaanites. Israel was not authorized to practice a scorched earth genocidal policy with all foreigners, but they were with the Canaanites. And I think by saying that these were counted as Canaanites means that God intended for Israel to do the same thing to the Philistines as to the Canaanites, which, of course, they did not find easy to do. Now, in verse 4, it says, From the south all the land of the Canaanites and Mir, Ra, uh, that belongs to the Sidonians as far as Aphek and the border of the Amorites. The land of the Gabalites and all Lebanon toward the sunrise from Baal Gad, which we mentioned earlier as uh, Caesarea Philippi, below Mount Hermon as far as the entrance to Hamath. All the inhabitants of the mountains from Lebanon as far as the brook Mes Misrephoth and the Sidonians, them I will drive out from before the children of Israel, only divide it by lot to, the, to Israel as an inheritance, as I have commanded you. Now therefore divide this land as an inheritance to the nine tribes and a half, the tribe of Manasseh. Now how are they figuring the nine and a half tribes? Well, two, in Israel there were really 13 tribes. Usually the count is almost art always artificially kept to 12 by the omission of one or another. You see, there were 12 sons of Jacob, but one of them, Joseph, had two sons, and Jacob adopted them as his own sons, not grandsons, which means that made the tribe of Joseph became two tribes, and therefore there were 13 tribes total. But 12 is, seems to be the, you know, the, the desirable number to keep it at for whatever reasons, and so when the tribes are listed many times, one or another tribe is just left out of the count. Often it's the Levites, because the Levites had special status, and when it came to inheritance, they, they were definitely unique in that they did not receive a portion of the land. We'll hear more about that. Uh, other times, the tribes of Manasseh and Ephraim, which are the two halves of the tribe of Joseph, are simply referred to as one group as the children of Joseph. Uh, other times, for strange reasons, one or another tribe is just left out randomly just to keep the number at 12, as in Revelation chapter 7, when we have the 144,000 given. It's 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. Well, it lists the tribes, but it leaves out Dan. Why? Well, there's all kinds of speculations why Dan's left out, but it may be just because someone had to be left out to keep it at 12, you know, because there's, it's always a bit artificial to list the 12 tribes as 12. But when it came to the inheritance and the division of the land, it was not so artificial because Levi was not given any land, so they weren't in the reckoning. That left 12 tribes, of which two and a half of them already had received their inheritance on the east side of the Jordan, so that leaves nine and a half to receive inheritance on the uh, west side. And these different areas are listed, primarily the Philistine areas and some of the other Canaanite areas. God says, I'm going to deliver them to you. I'm going to drive them out, he says in verse 6. But now it's time to divide the land. They're not driven out yet. Apparently what this means is that all of Israel worked in concert up to this point. All the tribes fought alongside each other to drive out the, the Canaanites to establish the borders and to secure the territory. But now they're going to divide that remaining territory into different tribal areas and whatever land within those areas remains to be conquered, it's going to be the responsibility of those tribes to do it. So Joshua is no longer going to be leading armies after this point, though there will be more wars. They will be wars that each of the tribes will be fighting against the, those in their local areas and sometimes not successfully as we shall see. Verse 8, with the other half tribe of the Reubenites, uh, I'm sorry, the other half tribe, meaning of Manasseh, the Reubenites and the Gadites received their inheritance. Now, let me just say this about the half, tri half the tribe of Manasseh. I do not know why it is, but one of Manasseh's sons, Maker, Maker uh, was the branch of the Manassite family that received 
uh, territory on the east of Jordan. The other part of the tribe of Manasseh didn't want to settle there. And therefore, they decided to take their portion where, they sh where God assigned it, in, inside the land. So we keep hearing about half the tribe of Manasseh, probably not, e not exactly 50%, but a, a portion of the tribe on this side and a portion of this tribe on the other side of the Jordan. The tribe was divided up by, by the choice of apparently one group of Manassites who wanted to stay with the Reubenites and the Gadites on the east side. So with these ones, it says, it says, with the other half tribe, the Reubenites and the Gadites received their inheritance, which Moses had given them beyond the river eastward as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had given them. Then it gives the dimensions again, as it has not too long ago. So we won't read all those dimensions that they conquered from Sion and Og. Uh, they seem to be fond of repeating all of that, which is probably because it was so great a victory. They like to repeat it. But it says in verse 13, Nevertheless, the children of Israel did not drive out the Geshrites or the Meacathites, uh, but the Geshrites and the Meacathites dwell among the Israelites until this day. So again, all these references to until this day remind us that the author is living at a time when many of these conditions still prevailed. Many of them which, of course, ceased to prevail within uh, you know, some years or centuries, but it's an uh, early writing the, from the author's point of view. A lot of these things that were true in Joshua's day had not changed yet. Only the tribe of Levi he had given no inheritance, verse 14 says. The sacrifices of the Lord God of Israel made by fire are their inheritance, as he said to them. Now, sometimes it says it that way, and sometimes it says it differently. The Levites did receive an inheritance, but it was not a real estate inheritance. It was not land. It was not farming land. It was not land on which you could make a living, because they had a living to make as full-time ministers at the tabernacle and they were to be supported by the tithes of the other people who did have farmland. So the Levites, of course, had to live somewhere and so there were a number of cities, 35 cities were given to them with, uh, with some common land outside the cities where they could actually keep some livestock. Uh, the Levites were able to have some livestock but they really didn't have acreage to grow crops and profit from agricultural pursuits. But they had cities designated to them in all the different tribal boundaries so that the Levites would not be far from anyone in Israel. And the Levites' task, of course, besides working at the tabernacle, was to teach the law to the people. So uh, God had Levites positioned in these cities throughout the bound through, through all the tribal areas. And instead of giving one area to the Levites, and it says here that their inheritance is the sacrifices of the Lord. What that means, of course, is that all the people of the nation, in addition to giving their tithes to the Levites, which would normally be in the form of grain, would also bring their sacrifices to the tabernacle and the meat that was not burnt in the whole burnt offerings, in, those, in that meat that was offered in other offerings, trespass offerings, sin offerings, and so forth, a, a major portion of that meat went to the Levites for their families to eat. And so he's saying what they get to live on is not land that they can farm, but the, uh, basically the rewards of being God's servants, which is that they get to eat of the sacrifices of the altar. They're in a special position that way. But on other occasions, the, the inheritance of the Levites is spoken of differently. For example, down in verse 33 of this same chapter, in Joshua 13:33 it says, But to the Levites... The tribe of Levi, Moses had given no inheritance. The Lord God of Israel was their inheritance, as he had said to them. So sometimes we're told their inheritance is the sacrifices that were offered to the Lord. But perhaps more importantly, their, their, their uh, inheritance was the privilege of serving the Lord, the Lord himself, being in his presence. Uh, remember that psalmist who said, you know, it's better to be uh, a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. The, the pleasure of being so near God. David said, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord, to meditate in his temple. 
the coming before God, to be where God was manifesting himself, was a great privilege. And the Levites, that's where they worked. They got to be in full-time ministry, in other words, and, and they got to enjoy the privilege of nearness to God, at least geographical, proximate nearness to God, in a way that other tribes were not able to do. And so that's their inheritance, their privilege. And that's ours, too. I mean, the Levites, in some respects, are a type of the church in the world. Uh, not in every sense, but in, in one sense, they're a type of full-time ministers in the church, like the other tribes support the Levites, so the church supports its full-time ministers. And Paul makes that point in 1 Corinthians 9. He's talking about how he, as a minister, in a sense, is entitled to the support from the rest of the church because he ministers in spiritual things, and it's no big thing for him to receive material things back. But he, in illustrating that, says, don't you know that those who serve at the altar eat of the altar? Uh, he's indicated that the Levites and the priests who are the full-time servants of God at the tabernacle in Israel are sort of correspond to, in some ways, the full-time ministers in the church in terms of their support. But uh, also the Levites or the priesthood, not all the Levites were priests, but the priesthood were selected from one of the families of the Levites, which was the Aaron's descendants, they are like uh, mediators to the rest of the tribes as the church is to the world. So there's different ways to see this, but the church certainly has the privilege of uh, inheriting God, but no inheritance in this world. Now, we do have an inheritance in the next world. The meek shall inherit the earth, but it won't be this one. It'll be when Jesus comes back and there's a new earth. That'll be ours. But this earth is not currently our home. We're strangers and pilgrims here. We're ambassadors here. We're visitors here, traveling through. And so we don't have an inheritance in the earth or in the land, so to speak, at this time. But, but we do have God as our inheritance. So the Levites, in some respects, are a picture of our own special privileges as the people of God. Now, in verse 15, chapter 13, 15 says, And Moses had given to the tribe of the children of Reuben an inheritance according to their families. Their territory was from Aurora, which is on the bank of the river Arnon, and the city that is in the midst of the ravine, all the plain of the Mediba, or by Mediba, Hezbon, and all its cities that are in the plain. Dibon, Bamoth, Baal, uh, Beth, Baal, Mion, Jehazah, Kedemoth, uh, Mepha, Mephaoth, uh, Kirjathaim, Sibma, Zareth, Shahar, and the mountain of the valley. Uh, Beth Peor, the slopes of Pisgah, and Beth Jeshimoth. All these cities, or all the cities of the plain, excuse me, and all the kingdom of Sion, king of the Amorites, who reigned in Heshbon, whom Moses had struck with the princes of the Midianites, uh, Evi, Rechim, Zur, uh, Hur, and Reba, who were princes of Sion dwelling in the country. The children of Israel also killed with the sword Balaam, the son of Baor, the soothsayer, among, whom, uh, among those that were killed by them. And the border of the children of Reuben was the bank of the Jordan. This was the inheritance of the children of Reuben according to their families, uh, the cities and the villages. So before we read about the apportionment of the land on the west side of the Jordan in, in the promised land, we're reviewing, you know, Reuben and Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh on the east side and being told more specifics about how that land was divided between those two and a half tribes. The mention of Balaam perhaps is the most interesting thing that stands out in that section because Balaam is an interesting character. Uh, in some ways he seems almost like a good guy and other times he seems almost like a bad guy. In general though, when you read his story in the book of Numbers, uh, you read more good about him than bad, in a sense. I mean, you read that he blesses Israel and, and the king Balak is angry with them and, and, and yet he says, I'm sorry, I can't speak anything, but Yahweh gives me to speak. And he seems to be very pious and a very good man, but actually the scriptures always remember him as a very evil man. In the New Testament, Balaam is said to be the one who loved the wages of unrighteousness. And uh, he actually was killed deliberately by the Israelites in a war that, that, that followed between them and the Midianites uh, because Balaam, he was a soothsayer and apparently he'd go into a trance 
when he would prophesy or, or speak. He was not a Jew, and he was not a Jewish prophet, and he was not a prophet of Yahweh, at least not exclusively. Apparently, he was kind of a freelance soothsayer who could uh, invoke any gods that people paid him to invoke. And uh, Balak, the king, asked Balaam to come and curse Israel. And Balaam said, well, let me ask God about that. Let me, ask, let me inquire of Yahweh. That's Israel's God. Let me see what he has to say. And God actually spoke to him and says, you can't curse these people. They're blessed. Leave them alone. And Balaam went out and said, I can't do it. Yahweh won't let me. But then they came back offering more money than before. And he said, well, let me double check on this. He went back in and asked again. And God said, sure, do what you want. Go ahead. Go do it. But don't, but don't say any more than I give you to say. And so he went. And that's the occasion when a donkey spoke. Because Balaam was on his way riding his donkey to fulfill this paid commission. And uh, an angel with a sword stood on the road and blocked him. The donkey saw the angel. Balaam did not. There's a seer for you. <laughs> You can't see as much as a donkey can see. But anyway, the donkey uh, hurt Balaam by trying to avoid the angel and moving up against a wall, hurt his foot, eventually just collapsed and lay down under him. Balaam was beating the donkey, and the, donkey, the Lord opened the donkey's mouth and said, why are you beating me? And he was so angry he didn't even realize that he was talking to a donkey. And he said, because you uh, have done these, you're behaving like a bad donkey, you know. And then he saw the angel... And he went ahead and, and he only spoke what the, Lord of, the word of the Lord said, but apparently that was despite himself. He wanted the money. The Bible says he loved the wages of unrighteousness. He wanted to curse them, but every time he went into a trance, God brought something else out of him, and he couldn't be paid. So it is implied by a number of passages of Scripture that Balaam found another way to get his wage and to do a, a workaround. He couldn't verbally curse Israel, but he could bring a curse on Israel he told Balak, if he would seduce them into idol worship, then God would curse them. And so he apparently counseled the king to send uh, beautiful women down among the men of Israel's camp and to seduce them into sexual behavior and into worshiping their, their god, Baal Peor, which was, uh, you know, these, these Canaanite gods were worshipped with sexual rites. And so if the, if the women are attractive enough, uh, then, the, then that kind of worship would be attractive to a certain uh, kind of man. And so they were able to draw men away into this uh, worship of Baal Peor, which brought a judgment of God on Israel. Well, later on, Moses and the children of Israel went to war against these people, and Balaam was killed in that battle, as we've just read. His crime is mentioned, though, in Numbers chapter 31, when initially the Israelites in their warfare against the Midianites brought back some of the women alive. And apparently we're going to spare them. But Moses rebuked them for that. In Numbers chapter 31, verses 15 and 16, Moses said to them, Have you kept the women alive, all the women alive? Look, these women caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the incident of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. So he's saying these women are as guilty as the men. They're even perhaps more guilty. They're the ones who went down and seduced our men and brought this plague upon us. Why did you leave them alive? But it mentions they did it through the counsel of Balaam. This is the first time we actually read that Balaam had done anything like this, like given this counsel. But it is affirmed also in the New Testament, uh, not only that he loved the wages of uh, unrighteousness, but the New Testament also tells us specifically what he did in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 14. In the, in the letter to the church of Pergamos, Jesus said in Revelation 2.14, but I have a few things against you. Because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. So uh, Balaam taught ba Balak to do this. He counseled Balak to get Israel to sin through sexual immorality and through uh, idolatry. So that's, that's why we read in Joshua 13, verse 22, that the children of Israel also killed Balaam. He... Uh, 
he was a worse man than he appears in the narratives in Numbers. Now, Joshua 13, 24, Moses also had given an inherit, as an inheritance uh, to the tribe of Gad, to the children of Gad, according to their families. Uh, their territory was Jazer and all the cities of Gilead and half the land of the Ammonites as far as Aror, which is before Rabbah. And from Hezbon to Ramath, Hizbah, and uh, Betonim, and from Mahanaim, uh, the border of Deber, and the valley of Beth Haram, Beth Nimrah, Sukkoth, and Zaphon, the rest of the kingdom of Sion, king of Hezbon, which the Jordan, with the Jordan as its border, as far as the edge of the Sea of Chinneroth, or Sea of Galilee, on the other side of the Jordan, eastward. This is the inheritance of the children of Gad, according to their families. And then, of course, the rest of this chapter, uh, we have of the half-tribe of Manasseh on the east of the, of the Jordan. Moses also gave an inheritance to the half-tribe of Manasseh. It was for half the tribe of the children of Manasseh, according to their families. Their territory was from Mahanaim, all Bashan, all the kingdom of Og, king of Bashan, and all the towns of Jair, which are in Bashan, 60 cities, half of Gilead and Ashtaroth and Edrei, cities of the kingdom of Og and Bashan were, uh, were for the children of Machir, the son of Manasseh, for half of the children of Machir, uh, according to their families. These are the area, areas which Moses had distributed as an inheritance in the plains of Moab on the other side of the Jordan by Jericho eastward. But, we're told, as we already read, to the tribe of Levi, Moses had given no inheritance because the Lord God of Israel was their inheritance as he had said to them. So, this chapter is occupied by essentially saying there's a lot of land to be conquered on the west side of the Jordan, but these eastern tribes have already received their inheritance according to the detailed descriptions that are there. Now, chapter 14, now to the west side of the Jordan, uh, there we deal first of all with the tribe of Judah and, and most particularly with one Judahite, Caleb. It says, these are the areas which the children of Israel inherited in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest, Joshua the son of Nun, and the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel distributed as an inheritance to them. Their inheritance was by lot, meaning they cast lots to decide who got what portions. As the Lord had commanded by the hand of Moses for the nine tribes and the half tribe. For Moses had given the inheritance of the two tribes and the half tribe on the other side of the Jordan. Yeah, I think we know that by now. But the Levites, he had given no inheritance among them. For You can see that's important. Now, it, it gets mentioned all the time. Apparently very important details. For the children of Joseph were two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim. And they gave no part of the, to the Levites in the land except cities to dwell in with their common lands for their livestock and their property. As the Lord had commanded Moses, so the children of Israel did. They divided the land. Then the children of Judah, this is just one of the tribes on the west side that's going to receive its portion, the first, uh, and, and to our minds perhaps the most important of the tribes, even in the Old Testament it was arguably the most important of the tribes because David the king came from Judah and all the kings of the southern kingdom came from Judah even after the other ten tribes broke off uh, and Judah was the, the tribe or the nation eventually that survived the Assyrian period when the northern kingdom fell Judah went into captivity in Babylon came back from Babylon and was still around in the time of Jesus and he's of the tribe of Judah so Judah is a very important tribe uh, from the standpoint of the rest of Scripture. Though at this point in time, Judah had not had any particular contribution they made more than others, but that when the 12 spies were sent in the land and two came back giving a good report, one of them was uh, Joshua of the tribe of Ephraim. The other was Caleb, who was of the tribe of Judah, although here he's called the Kenizzite, which is an interesting designation for him. He's referred to that by in other places too, it says, the children of Judah came to Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, you know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. Now, these guys had gone out and scouted out the land together when they were young men. They're old men now. 
and they're the o they're the oldest men in the whole country because everyone else is at least 20 years younger than they are because uh, Caleb says he was 40 years old and everyone who is over 20 died in the wilderness except him and, and Joshua so everyone's at least 20 years younger than he is uh, but he's still strong and vigorous and he says do you remember Joshua when we went on that errand and we came back and Moses through the Lord through Moses gave us certain promises well I was 40 years old when Moses the servant of the Lord sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land and I brought back word to him as it was in my heart nevertheless my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt but I wholly followed the Lord my God this is the one thing that's said most frequently about Caleb this, this particular thing it's even said several times even uh, in this context but it says I wholly followed the Lord my God so Moses swore on that day saying surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever because you have wholly followed the Lord my God now those are not the exact words of Moses it's a paraphrase the actual words that Moses said on this occasion are in chapter 14 of Numbers and it's uh, not, not very specific about the land that he will inherit but in Numbers 14.24 the Lord says my servant Caleb because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully I will bring into the land where he went and his descendants shall inherit it. That's about as specific as it gets, that he will have an inheritance in the land. He is now going to suggest that there's a certain mountain that the Lord spoke of. In verse 12 of Joshua 14, he talks about a certain mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. Maybe there was more specific information given to Moses about this that we're not, we don't read about previously. Verse 10, And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these 45 years. Now, here we have a, an important chronological note. The land has been conquered and now is being divided and Caleb is 85 years old. He was 40 at Kadesh Barnea. And after Kadesh Barnea, the children of Israel wandered for 38 years. Now it's been 45 years because he was 40 then, he's 85 now. So it's been 45 years now since the spies went into the land and brought back the report. Of those 45 years, 38 were occupied with the children of Israel wandering through the wilderness. So that means that now it's been seven years since they entered the promised land. And so that's how we know pretty much how long it took to reach this point. It was the, the conquests of the land essentially occupied seven years. And this is how we know, actually, because of his reference to his age on these two places. Um, he says, I was 45. Or, uh, I was 40 then, but he says, these 45 years ever since the Lord spoke his word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now here I am this day 85 years old. Verse 11, as yet I am as strong this day as I was on the day that Moses sent me. At 85, he's as strong as he was when he was 40. And yet these people didn't live hundreds and hundreds of years like they did in pre-flood times. These men died at 100 and something usually. Joshua died at 110. And so 85 was still pretty old. Now he might be, in a sense, boasting a little. It may be that he's not really quite as strong as he was when he was 40. It's very unusual if he was. He could be, but... But it's also possible he's using it hyperbole, saying, I'm as ready to fight now as I was then. I'm still feeling my, still feel my oats. I feel still, I, I've got a lot of vigor still, just like I did then. I still have a lot of vigor. That doesn't necessarily mean he hasn't gotten some creaky joints or something by this time. As yet I'm as strong this day as I was the day that Moses sent me, just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both in, for going out and for coming in. Now, therefore, give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you heard in that day how that the Anakim were there and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will help me and I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. Uh, this mountain is the mountain of Hebron. Uh, 
And it is apparently the, the stronghold of the giants of whom the, the, the ten faithless spies had said, no, we can't defeat these giants. And Joshua had at that earlier occasion, yeah, we can. The Lord can help us. The Lord can help us defeat them. But it was these giants, the Anakim in Hebron, in that mountain, that were the particular intimidation and obstacle to the children of Israel 40 year, 45 years earlier than this. And Caleb says, you know, I think God's going to give me any, any land I want. I'll take the giants. I'll take them on. You know, I mean, he could have asked for any of the land that had already, already been conquered. That was already subdued. But he's just a spunky old guy. He's saying, you know, these are the, this is the giants that everyone was afraid of. I'm feeling like I want to go take them on. And I want to take their land from them. And so uh, Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron formerly was Kirjath Arba. Now, Kirjath means city of, and Arba is a man's name. And there's other Kirjath somethings uh, in, in the scripture, and it always means the city of something. Uh, this, in this case, it's the city of Arba. For Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. Then the land had rest from war. Now, uh, it says that Arba who was probably dead by this time. Uh, the city had been named after him, so he was probably from some generations earlier. But he was the greatest man among the Anakim. We're told in chapter 15 and verse 13, he was actually the father of Anak. Now the Anakim were named after their ancestor Anak. And his dad was Arba. And we see that in chapter 15, verse 13, at the very end. It says in parentheses, Arba was the father of Anak. So, the, the family of Anak were a family of giants. Arba was probably a giant. He's in fact said to be the, the, the greatest man among the Anakim. That probably means the biggest man among them. And he's the father of that clan. And so it used to be named after him. But it's going to have its name changed. He's going to be, all the Anakim are going to be driven out. And it's going to be known as Hebron from now on instead of Kirjath Arba. Now, I mentioned this reference to Joshua the Kenizzite as a strange thing because the Kenizzites were not Israelites. And yet we are told elsewhere, and even here it's implied, that, jo that Caleb was, uh, was of the tribe of Judah. I mean, we read in verse 6, then the children of Judah came to Joshua and Caleb, implying that he came as one of the children of Judah to make this request. In Genesis uh, or first of all, in Numbers 13, when Moses is selecting the spies to go into the land and spy it out, and Caleb is one of them, Moses picks one spy from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And we read in verse 6, Numbers 13, 6, from the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. So it's clear that Caleb was of the tribe of Judah. And yet he's twice here and, and sometimes elsewhere called the Kenizzite. Now the Kenizzites were uh, the, the descendants of someone named Kenaz. And he's mentioned as one of the descendants of Esau, an Edomite. One of the branches of the Edomite uh, race. In Genesis 36... And verse 11, it's giving a catalog of the family of Esau and those who descended from him. And it says, the sons of Eliphaz were Teman, Omar, Zepho, Gatam, and Kenaz, from whom, of course, the Kenizzites come. So we see that the Kenizzites, as a race, were Edomites, descendants from Esau, not Jews. But since Caleb is called a Kenizzite on many occasions and also called of the tribe of Judah, we have to just assume there's some intermarriage there, that somewhere in his family, perhaps his parents, probably, uh, maybe his father was a, a Jew and his mother was a Kenizzite, or maybe it was in the grandparents' generation, but somehow those two families, had come, those two races had come together and he was the product of a marriage that was interracial. So, we have 
him going after the giants and, and defeating him. We're not given any details of the battle here. However, in chapter 15, in verse 13 and following, it retells this in more detail. And uh, we'll get to that in a moment. And there's also a parallel to it in the book of Judges, chapter 1. So this conquest of this region by Caleb and his family, we'll hear more about in a moment. But we've just, we're about to, in chapter 15, be told about the tribal boundaries that were given to uh, Judah. And since he was of the tribe of Judah, and he's the most remarkable man of Judah in that time, we've gotten some special attention to him and his inheritance. But chapter 15 says, this then was the lot of the tribe of the children of Judah, according to their families. Uh, the border of Edom at the wilderness of Zin, southward, was the extreme uh, southern boundary. And their southern border began at the shore of the Salt Sea, that's the Dead Sea, from the bay that faces southward. Then it went out uh, to the south, southern side uh, of the ascent of Akrabim. I'm pretty sure the word Akrabim in Hebrew means scorpions, so there's a place apparently named after the large number of scorpions in that region, passed along to Zin as a, uh, and ascended on the south side of Kadesh Barnea, passed along to Hezron, went up to Adar, and went around to Karkea. From there it passed toward Asmon and went on, and we, we have some other designations. Uh, we could read all of this if we had uh, infinite time on our hands, and and if we had any way of making any of these places mean something to us. Uh, in many cases, we don't even know where their locations are. The writer knew. And they were current, current markers in his day. But in, in many cases, not, not around anymore. And even the ones that are, uh, it's not all that important for us today to know exactly what the boundaries of Judah were, except to know that it was the southern region of the country. Judah got a very large inheritance all the way from the Mediterranean to the, the Dead Sea in the southernmost region of the land of Canaan. And that's pretty much what we need to know. Uh, there is mentioned there in verse 8 that the border went up by the valley of the son of Hinnom to the southern slope of the Jebusite city, which is Jerusalem. Notice how ancient this book is. It was written before David conquered Jerusalem. And uh, the author refers to Jerusalem as the Jebusite city, which... It was, of course, until David conquered it. And he mentions it as it's also called Jerusalem. Now, anyone living after David's time would not speak in that offhand way about that city, which was their capital and, their, and where their you know, sacred ark was and so forth. They wouldn't say that Jebusite city called Jerusalem. You know, It's obvious that this is a very early record before, before the author himself even knew that Jerusalem would ever be a capital of the people of Israel. It's just another Canaanite city at this point. And then it talks about the border turning westward at verse 10 and, and so forth. But like I said, we don't need to really be that familiar with the details of these borders. Then we have the story of Caleb told in a little more detail in verse 13 and following. Now to Caleb the son of Jephunneh he gave a portion among the children of Judah according to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua, namely Kirjath Arba, which is Hebron. Arba was the father of Anak. Caleb drove out the three sons of Anak from there, Sheshai, Ahiman, and Talmai, the children of Anak. And no doubt they were all giants. Then he went up from there to the inhabitants of Debir. Formerly the name of Debir was Kirjath Sefer. Now actually in chapter 10, verses uh, 38 and 39, Deber is one of the cities that uh, Joshua had conquered earlier. But apparently when the Israelites would conquer a city, if they didn't burn it down, they moved along to the next city, and sometimes these people who had fled just came back and repopulated, probably with much less spirit to resist than before, and uh, greatly chastened and, and uh, more submissive, but still they came back. In this case, they might not have been submissive. They might have wanted to re store their independence from Israel and Caleb came and had to defeat them again but here's how he did it Caleb said he who attacks Kirjath Sefer and takes it to him I will give Aksa my daughter as wife that's sort of like what Saul said that anyone who will bring him you know 
a thousand Philistine foreskins will be able to marry his daughter, Michael. Um, I guess that's one way to make sure your daughter be taken care of. You can get, you know, the man who wants to marry my daughter, he's got to be able to kill a thousand of the enemy himself, you know. Or he's got to conquer a city himself. Then I'll know my daughter will be well taken care of by a guy like that. And so Othniel, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, um, he took it and gave it to Aksaw. Uh, he gave him Aksaw, the daughter, as a wife. Now, Othniel eventually became the first of the judges in the book of Judges also. Same guy. Son-in-law, or uh, not son-in-law, but uh, nephew of Caleb and became his son-in-law. Now, it was so when she, that is Caleb's daughter, came to her husband that she persuaded him to ask her father for a field. Apparently, he persuaded, she persuaded her husband to let her ask because she's the one who did so. So she dismounted from her donkey and Caleb said to her, what do you wish? She said, give me a blessing. Since you have given me a land in the south, give me also springs of water. Apparently it was nice land, but there weren't any springs and you need that. So he gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. Then we have a list of the cities of Judah. Over a hundred of them. We won't uh, go into them. We won't read them all. It's not necessary. It, uh, it gives them in several different regions. In verses uh, 20 through 32, it lists... Uh, what, 29 cities that are in the southern region of the territory. Then verses 33 through 47 talks about a bunch of cities that are in the lowland areas, followed by a list of mountain cities in verses 48 through 60. And finally, in verses 61 and 62, a couple of cities uh, in the wilderness, uh, more than a couple, a few cities in the wilderness area near the Dead Sea. And finally, in verse 63, as for the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the children of Judah could not drive them out. But the Jebusites dwell with the children of Judah at Jerusalem to this day. So again, this is before Jerusalem became a Jewish city. They, at the time of writing, the writer says the Jebusites still control Jerusalem. Now, in uh, the first chapter of uh, Judges, it makes this very same statement about the tribe of Benjamin, that they were not able to drive out the uh, Jerusalemites. In, in Judges 1.21, it says, But the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who inhabited Jerusalem, so the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. It's almost verbatim the same, except in Joshua it's the Judahites who couldn't do it, and in Judges it's the Benjamites who couldn't. Why? Because Jerusalem was right on the boundary of the tribe of Judah and Benjamin. And it didn't belong distinctly for most of the time to either tribe. Eventually, it was pretty much a solidly uh, Judah, Jewish city. But uh, originally, it was on the border of Benjamin and Judah. And apparently, Judah had the task of conquering it, at least part of it. And Benjamites did too. And initially, neither could drive out the Jebusites. In the days of David, however, David drove out the Jebusites, at least out of the Jewish portion. But uh, the Benjamites never were able to drive them out. Okay, so we're going to stop there. It's time to take a break, and we'll keep going through when we come back.